What's up, Cheeseheads? Long time no see. As always, thank you for joining me. My name is Paul Brettel. I'm the site editor over at Dairyland Express, where we cover the Packers, Brewers, Bucks, and Badgers. I also have a new article out every Monday and Friday over at Cheesehead TV. As it says at the bottom of the screen, if you're watching on YouTube, you can find me on Twitter at Paul underscore Brettel. So for today's episode, I wanted to discuss my five big things to keep our eyes on as this, you know, as the Green Bay Packers take on the Los Angeles Rams in a massive, massive game with huge playoff implications. Now, I wouldn't call this must win by any means. Um, that still seems a little too strong of a term for where we're at in this time of this point in the season, given Green Bay's record, but it is a big one especially when it comes down to playoff seating within the NFC. So it's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a big one. It's a very important one. And then the Green Bay Packers get a much needed buy. But again, I want to discuss my five big things to keep our eyes on as we head into this game. You can find the article version of this topic over at Dairyland Express. So let's dive right in with, well, to me, the biggest one. This game is going to be, as most are, won or lost in the trenches. So can this Green Bay Packers offensive line can they hold it together against Aaron Donald and the Rams? Of the Green Bay Packers' five preferred starters, they're down three of them. Josh Myers still sideline, David Bakhtiari still out, and of course Elton Jenkins unfortunately suffered an ACL injury and he's done for the season. So now it's going to be Yash, John Runyon, Lucas Patrick, Royce Newman, and Billy Turner as the Green Bay's starting five on Sunday. There was one other game this season. It was against Cincinnati where these five were the preferred starters for that week uh, against the Bengals. As I mentioned, they gave up to just two sacks, only nine pressures. Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon combined for, I believe it was 133 rushing yards. So it was a solid performance and by no means is the Bengals defensive front at the Rams level. They don't have an Aaron Donald esque player, but that's still a, a good defensive front that green Bay went up against. So this current five, they have played together outside of, you know, the the Minnesota game last week after Jenkins left, where those five were the starters for that week. But as I mentioned, Aaron Donald, this Rams front, it's a different animal. And I know we can look back at the NFC playoffs from this past year when Green Bay went up against Aaron Donald. And for the most part, they were able to contain him. However, I think it's very, very important to note that Aaron Donald was not fully healthy for that game. Matt LaFleur has talked about that this week. Aaron Rodgers has talked about that this week. They're getting a 100% Aaron Donald. And as we know, as he's done for a number of years now, he's still wreaking havoc. Next to him is uh, at edge rusher, of course, Leonard Floyd. The uh, Rams recently acquired Von Miller. Greg Gaines along the interior, Sean Robinson. I mean, they have a lot. This It's not just Aaron Donald. This is a deep, deep group. And it shows in their overall numbers as a unit. Uh, the Rams currently rank second by ESPN's pass rush win, uh, win rate metric. They're third in PFF's grading system in terms of pass rush. They're only allowing four yards per rush this season, which is the fifth fewest per carry in football. And then on top of that, they're seventh in quarterback pressures. Top to bottom. And like I said, it's not just Aaron Donald. He's certainly something you got to watch out for, though. But top to bottom, this is a very good Rams defensive front that Green Bay will be up against. So can this offensive line hold it together? Of course, there's things that Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers can do. One, lean on the run game. Now, it's not going to be easy to run the ball by any means, but allowing this offensive line to be the aggressor, fire off the ball, be the one trying to get that push rather than pass pro, you know, where that's more of the two more passive because you're retreating in a way. Um, so run the ball. Tr that Running the ball is going to be an absolute must for this team. When they pass the ball, as we saw against the Niners with Bosa, have tight ends available to help Chip, to help Yosh, to, or Yash, to help Billy Turner. The quick passes, screens, play action, boots, utilize motion. These are all things that Matt LaFleur or Aaron Rodgers can do to help out this, this offensive line against a very tough opponent. But ultimately, there are going to be a number of instances where Yash or Runyon or Newman, whoever it may be, they're going to be one-on-one. -on -one. They're going to be on an island, and it's going to be up to them to win that one-on-one -on -one matchup or to create that running lane. There's only so much protection that Lafleur and Rodgers can provide. Ultimately, these guys are going to have to step up, and they're going to have to play really well. And if the run game's struggling or if Green Bay falls behind early and they become one-dimensional pass heavy, that is a recipe for disaster. Matt LaFleur, he's hasn't lost a lot as a head coach here, but when he has, 
it, the same tendency has shown itself where they get blown out, they get away from the run game, pressure gets to Aaron Rodgers. And by the way, by several metrics this season, uh, completion percentage, yards per attempt, passer rating, Aaron Rodgers is actually one of the worst quarterbacks, according to Pro Football Focus, when under pressure. So keeping him clean is going to be a must. But again, the Packers can help themselves out by quick passes and everything else that I had just mentioned. So it's it's not going to be easy, but this matchup here, this is my biggest one. This is what's going to decide this game ultimately. Next up, let's switch to the other side of the ball and stay in the trenches. Can the Green Bay Packers pressure Matthew Stafford? When Stafford's had a clean pocket to throw from this season, he's 12th among all quarterbacks in completion percentage. He's fifth in pass rating, third in yards per attempt. He's been very good. Obviously, he has Cooper Cup. He has Odell Beckham to throw to now as well. This will be his second game with the Rams. So it's going to be important for Green Bay to pressure Stafford because especially with Cooper Cup, but as well as the rest of the receivers, it's already going to be a tough task for the secondary. And we'll get into this more here in a bit, but it's already going to be a tough task for them to try to limit Cooper Cup. And if Stafford has time in the pocket, that job gets exponentially more difficult if you're now asking Green Bay's corners to have to cover those receivers for four, five, six seconds at a time. So can the Green Bay Packers generate the, the needed pass rush? Last week against Minnesota, they, uh, according to Pro Football Focus, they generated 22 pressures, which is actually their fifth most in a game this season. And they did so without Rashawn Gary. However, it required, especially in the second half, some, some blitzes from Joe Barry to be dialed up in order for them to find that success. There were also a few instances, a few key instances, where the pass rush was very, very close to getting home, but it wasn't quite there quick enough. And Kirk Cousins was able to deliver what ended up being on those few occasions, a big pass to most of the time, Justin Jefferson. So Green Bay is going to have to get there a little bit quicker. Positive news, Rashawn Gary, he's listed as questionable again, but he's trending in the right direction. On Friday, he was a full participant at practice for the first time since he had his elbow injury. So hopefully he will be back in the mix. It's also worth pointing out that against this Rams offensive line, which by the way, has been very, very good this season uh, by ESPN's pass blocking metrics, pro football focus pass blocking metrics. They're one of, if not the best offensive line unit in football. They've given up the fewest pressures this season. It's not going to be easy getting to Stafford, but we saw a few weeks ago the Tennessee Titans really have success pressuring him up the middle. So, of course, the Packers have Kenny Clark. If Rashawn Gary's available, we've seen him fill a similar role to what Zadaria Smith did a season ago in lining up in those A and B gaps to try to generate pressure from the middle. So look for Green Bay to try to uh, take advantage of that part of this Rams offensive line. Also, don't be surprised to see Barry dial up more blitzes again because getting pressure on Stafford is going to be that important. But it's not going to be easy against this defensive or offensive line that the Rams have. Third big thing to watch for, can the Green Bay Packers offense get off to a fast start? One of the big differences between the 2020 version of this Packers offense, which was by several metrics, the best in football, and this year's team is they just are not scoring out the gate. Oftentimes this season, I think it's in most games, the Packers have been down by at least seven points at some time because they're just not getting off to those quick starts. There's two things that really stand out as to why. The big one, I think, is practice time or lack thereof. Rodgers missed practice all this week, so it's not going to get any better in that regard. But a week ago Friday, so heading into the Minnesota game, that was Rodgers' first practice, and it was only in a limited capacity, but that was his first practice since he was out with COVID, uh, so end of October. And before that, he had not practiced with Devontae Adams or Al Lazard until the third week of October. It had been since he had practiced with them. And then there's MVS. That was his first practice with MVS since prior to week three against the 49ers. If you recall following that game, MVS would go on IR. He would make his return against Kansas City when Aaron Rodgers was out. Rodgers was, would miss the whole following week of practice before returning against Seattle. And then he didn't practice until the following Friday. And so that's when him and MVS were first able to uh, be on the practice field and since nearly the beginning of the season. He's an MVP. He has terrific connection with these receivers. 
but we've seen practice time still matters. And the Green Bay Packers and the receivers, Aaron Rodgers, they have not had that together in going on a month now for the most part. So there's definitely some rust, and we saw that against the Vikings game or in the Vikings game. Rodgers was, I want to say, he looked tentative at times. It looked like there were some easy completions he passed up. Maybe wasn't just fully trusting what he was seeing. He was holding on to the ball, and this transition to transitions into what I think the other problem is, just the, the, the opening script, the play calling, the game plan early on. Against the Vikings, they were just looking for those deep shots. And I get it. You want to have that home run play. You want to get off that fast start. But that's not how this offense does it. And they were not leaning on the run game. It was very pass heavy. But we saw them transition in the second half. This what that was Packers football. It was everything that I'd mentioned in that opening, um, you know, point or what to watch for with the offensive line and how they can help. There was a better run pass mix, quick passes, play action, motion, boots, all of that stuff. And we saw this offense really gel and find a rhythm, something they haven't been able to do early on. So the lack of practice time, I mean, they haven't practiced this week together. Rogers was out all week. So there's only so much you can do on that front, but the play calling, leaning on the run game not tr- looking for those deep shots right out the gate, not holding on to the ball, getting the ball out of his hands quickly. That's going to be a must, especially this week against that Rams uh, defensive front with the Green Bay Packers banged up offensive line. So that point transitions into this one. Will the Green Bay Packers establish and stick to the run game? In the previous points, I've already talked about the importance of this, but for whatever reason the season – especially early on, we've seen them get away from the run game. Now, this run game has not been dominant by any means, and I believe that that has a lot to do with the offensive line, the musical chairs that have been played this season, just with all the injuries and movement that they've had. This has not been the same dominant run game that we saw a year ago. They're not breaking off the big runs as frequently as they did a year ago. But Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon have still certainly been effective more than enough to say, hey, we can lean on them for, you know, the majority of this game if needed. They're still picking up over four yards per carry. Again, that's not sexy. That's not gaudy numbers, but that is certainly an effective amount. And Green Bay is going to need to lean on them again, and they're absolutely going to have to find success. As I mentioned earlier, when the Packers have lost, the the key component in all that is that they've abandoned the run. They've gotten one-dimensional because they've fallen behind. And in those circ- and in those situations, when they're one dimensional, that defensive front, they're able to pin their ears back. They're able to put pressure on Rodgers. And as I said, he has not fared well, especially this season when under pressure and against this defensive front. As I mentioned, that's just going to be a recipe for disaster. So Green Bay is going to have to find a way against this Rams uh, defensive front to find success on the ball, and they're going to have to stick with it. There's going to be some carries, uh, there's probably going to be several carries, where Jones, hopefully if he plays, uh, or Dylan, they're not going to pick up a lot of yardage. But Green Bay needs to stick to that. They need to keep this Rams defense honest and at least have them believing that in certain situations, Green Bay might run the ball in that scenario. All that is that's going to create also a positive trickle down to the offensive line, as I'd mentioned, let them be the aggressor and just the passing game in general. So the key to this game for me, of course, starts up front with the offensive line, but number two, the Green Bay needs to establish and run the ball. So my last big thing to watch, so let's switch to the Rams offense. It's Cooper Cup. Cooper Cup is doing some serious damage this season. Green Bay just got torched by Justin Jefferson. Cooper Cup is first in receiving yards this year. He's at almost 1,200. He's first in receiving touchdowns, and he's second in targets. He is Matt LaFleur's, or excuse me, Matthew Stafford's go-to option this season that he relies heavily on him. The big difference between Cup and Justin Jefferson, for example, is that Cooper Cup does a lot of his damage, takes most of his snaps from the slot. So that means that falls on Shannon Sullivan, who I must say, has been very decent this season. Now, his completion percentage, quarterbacks have found success throwing the ball his direction. He's given up 71% completion percentage, but he's doing a good job of limiting plays. He's given up only 10 yards per catch, and his yards per uh, snaps of 0.8 is the fourth best among cornerbacks this season, according to Pro Football Focus. So he's held up very well, but he has not yet gone up against a Cooper Cup or someone of that caliber. So what's the best way that Green Bay can provide Sullivan and just the cornerbacks in general with some help against Cup? 
We already talked about it. Get pressure on Matthew Stafford. Do not give him time. If he has that four, five, six seconds, I don't care who's on Cooper Cup. It is going to be extremely difficult to cover for that long. The second thing that this Green Bay Packers defense can do falls on Joe Barry. So in this Joe Barry defense, I'm sure as we're all aware by now, they're always going to play with more light boxes than with extra defenders up there. That's just part of the defensive uh, makeup of what Joe Barry runs. Now, we saw them really, really lean into that when they went up against Arizona, Kansas City, and Seattle. They were basically daring those teams to run the football because Joe Barry said, we are not going to give up anything in the passing game. You run the ball on us, but we're not going to let you move it through the air. And that's they didn't. Against those in those three games against the likes of Kyler Murray, Patrick Mahomes, and Russell Wilson, this Packers defense gave up just 601 total passing yards. So that's a little over 200 per game. They only allowed one passing touchdown. They had four interceptions. This past week, however, against Minnesota, and again, Green Bay is always going to be more. Uh, they're always going to run with more light boxes than not. The question is, what's that ratio going to be? Well, against Minnesota, we saw them have more defenders in the box than what they had previous weeks. Reason being, they're up against Dalvin Cook. So they wanted to also try to limit that running game as well, something that they've been, uh, Dalvin Cook in particular, has had a lot of success against them in the past. So with that, if you have extra defenders in the box, that means there's less in the secondary, which can open up the passing game, and it definitely did as we saw. So this week, I do expect Green Bay to go more back, go towards what they did schematically in terms of how often they run with light boxes, what they did against Arizona, Seattle, and Kansas City in an effort to try to shut down that Rams passing game as much as possible because on the ground, they're only averaging four yards per carry, which ranks 22nd in the NFL. So they've been far from dominant on the ground and the screaming Packers run defense with Kenny Clark in the middle, Devondre Campbell uh, at linebacker, and just the overall better play from players like uh, Kingsley Kiki, Dean Lowry, Tyler Lancaster, the addition of TJ Slayton, this run defense, not great by any means, but certainly improved. So my expectation going up against a Cooper Cup and Odell Beckham Jr., a quarterback like Max Stafford, is they're going to do everything that they can to try to take away that passing game. And if the Rams are able to move the ball a little on the ground, I think Green Bay is going to be okay with that. But ultimately, in the end, Cooper Cup, he's one of those players where he's still going to put up numbers. It's hard to envision Green Bay completely shutting him down. The key is do not let him go. Justin, Justin Jefferson and take this game over. Do not let him be the dominant force that drives this Rams offense. That's what you're looking to hopefully limit. Uh, and that'll ultimately overall help slow this Rams offense. So those are my five big things to keep our eyes on. As always, there are more, but those are the five that really stand out and are what are going to play key, key roles in determining this game. As always, everyone, I appreciate you joining me. As I mentioned initially, you can find my work at Dairyland Express and She Said TV. You can find me on Twitter at Paul underscore Brettle. As always, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. So take care, stay safe. Let's hope for a Packers win. And as always, go Pack Go!